My name is Marco Sinche. I'm a Korean American adoptee. I am 35 years old, I had to think about that. According to the papers, and if you see a lot of other videos, us adoptees, we say according to the papers, right? Because uh, turns out that might not always be the case. But uh, yeah, according to the papers, I was, I was born in Seoul, in Shilim, in fact, and I was at an orphanage for a little bit. Arrived to the States when I was nine months. And uh, yeah, I lived up, it lived in a small suburban town in uh, Pennsylvania, a little bit outside of Philadelphia. My older brother, uh, who is also adopted, but he's adopted domestically from Pennsylvania. He's 10 years older than me, so he's quite a bit older. I have a lovely mom and dad. All three are Caucasian. So growing up, uh, there were not, again, there were not a lot of other adoptee kids around me, not a lot of other Asian kids around me. Uh, there was a period in my life where, where um, I was really dealing with a lot of uh, adoptive related issues. I just had to grow myself, you know, I had to um, kind of self-reflect and and uh, just grow and, and just also work around kids a lot. I, I've worked with with children for a very long time in the States. So Holt, Holt International, right? That's the adoption organization. Then there's uh, Holt Station in the U.S. and they have a, um, a camp. For the rest of the time, it's your regular old camp. You did swimming, climbing, all that camp stuff twice a day you would have these kind of discussions, one as an entire group with your whole age group and another one within your cabin. And uh, you just talk about, uh, you talk about uh, racism, you talk about stereotypes, you talk about uh, adoptive, uh, what it's like. Like I did that camp and I, I feel really bad because my parent, my mom was like, you went to that camp and you came back like just really upset or, or, or frustrated because these kids brought up these questions and I'm like, hey, yeah, I never thought about that, you know? So I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty great. That camp, uh, teach, talking to these kids, it was a learning experience for me too, to hear what these kids went through, um, to have them talk about it, right? When I was in elementary school, I would really would love to have been like a paleontologist, the, the people who dig up fossils or marine biologists I, or, or even a, a meteorologist. I loved science. I would ask my mom for, for not like, like kids books on nature. I would ask for actual, like, like a field manual of the local, of the local plant life of Pennsylvania. Right. And I would just, yeah, just like learning all the scientific names and everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I went to um, Lock Haven University. It's a small state school in the middle of Pennsylvania, in the middle of Pennsylvania. My first two years, two full years of university, I didn't have a clue. Um, you know, I went in with marine biology because that's what I wanted to be as a, a when I was a kid. I figured uh, maybe that wasn't for me, but also I didn't try very hard. I was really floundering around. I bounced between majors. I was a um, marine biology major, went to English literature, uh, enjoyed that enough. I kept that as a minor, but it just wasn't my thing. Finally switched over to art. Yeah, it wasn't until my sophomore year of university that I eventually just switched over to art I, as, as my major. I just kind of gave into it. In high school, I would just kind of like... You know, I'm doing all the other stuff. I'm playing football and doing all everything else. But every now and then, I would still do like a like a, an art course, or whatever, like a, a painting class. And my teacher would be like, "Mark, like you're really good at this. You, you, this is so you can just do it, right?" Um, but I think I was fighting that for a while. I was fighting I, because I I hate to say it. I thought it wasn't cool. I thought it wasn't. Um, what a popular kid would do or or what it would take me. I mean, I you look on the TV and it's all about athletes and it's all about movie stars, right? As a 16-year-old kid, I didn't really see what the future was of art. But again, looking back, I am thankful for going to that little school because, again, I would just take one art course every semester, just take one. And my art professor, of who I can consider a friend, he would just walk by and he would just be like, Mark, that's a really good painting. You should switch over to art. And he would just walk away. So eventually gave in and uh, switched over to art. So like uh, we had our main uh, cafeteria, right? And it, here I am, again, I'm, I'm fresh out of high school from my small town. All my friends are white or, you know, we're just 
I don't know, me and my college buddies, right? And we just get our lunch and then there would be the table. The table of, uh, at the time, I didn't know, I just saw they were Asian, but they were, the, that was the Korean group. And they were all hanging out together and I would kind of side glance at them like, hmm. but they'd all kind of like, look at me, right? And I, 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 I points I would just be like you, you know what's their problem like do you all right there like they're just staring at me like look at something else I don't know but I wasn't grab I wasn't drawn towards them I was a bit repelled or a bit suspicious or just like not sure what was going on and it wasn't until I moved into a house of guys uh, that 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 moment it would really open my mind to stuff because up until that point I kind of hung out with a certain group of group of dudes group of guys uh, but then when I moved into this house, it was like uh, somebody who, a break dancer who studied in Spain for two years, another one who studied in, in, in Scotland for a year, a Russian exchange student, a uh, cage fighter from New York. And they were really, um, they were really in with the exchange group because they were abroad. They, they've, they, I don't know. I just felt at the time they were more worldly or they were more cultured, what have you. But um Whenever there would be a party, you know, a house party or something, um, all the exchange students, they would come to our house. In fact, that, that town was a bit on the conservative side. These students, these kids, they might have been, they might be turned away from parties. You can't party here kind of stuff, right? So uh, in came the Koreans, right? In, in came and uh, they were, Super staring at me hard now because they realized I was living there. I was I was one of the guys that was throwing these parties. So uh, after after enough uh, courage, I kind of cornered one of them. I don't. But I was just like, hey man, like, what's going on? Like, why why what is your fascination with me? Why are you staring at me all the time? And they're just like, oh, it's because like we we do we find you really different and interesting because you speak English fluently and you just hang out with the, these other people and just wanted to learn more about you and we were just really curious and that was that and then you know we just became instant friends after that and uh yeah i i went ahead and uh, uh went to one of their gatherings as well uh, he he called me up and he's like hey like i'm having a little get together come over to my apartment and i went in and opened the door and it's got to be like 20 or 30 koreans and they're just like hey welcome nice to have you and I was just like, ah, and you know, I've had soju before, no idea about the drinking culture. So it's like, oh, great soju. Went over, took a bottle, cracked it open and just straight from the bottle. It's like record scratch, like in the whole room, right? Everybody just stops, you know? And, and there was just like, oh, I, I, I realized, okay, like I think this is not how it's done, right? But uh, yeah, that, I, that's how I became, very close with a, those uh, with that group of people, and um, my Korean friend, he he really was just like, ah oh, man, then just go over. Like when you're after you're graduating, just come on over. At the time, I didn't know I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to. I was like my parents wouldn't know how to. I was just like, how could I even consider or think about going over there? Yeah, after I graduated, I just had a part time job and then just did what I, just tried my hardest just to figure out ways if I could. Um, or find work at a local academy, Hagwon, or what have you. And again, it comes back to HALT. So HALT uh, here in Korea, they have a homecoming program. What it is is adoptees had the chance to come back over here and they were provided room and board with a stay at, with a stay at home family. They were with a, a Korean family. And so, uh, yeah, they would just have us work at kind of these different uh, locations. And after that, uh, you know, in the process, you get the visa, the F4 visa, which is for overseas Koreans and, and uh, Kyopos and, and um, adoptees. And so once I had that visa secured, picked up all sorts of part-time jobs. Uh, primarily, yes, it was teaching English. I was teaching at a uh, private elementary school. So school, just uh, your, your elementary school for about eight and a half years. And that was my main job, but then um, just all sorts of side work, voice work, uh, radio work. And then uh, about a year and a half ago, I switched over fully to um, uh, radio and broadcast in that sector. 
still, again, I had a lot of struggle as a person who studied art, even after I graduated. And I think a lot of art students were thinking, uh, who studied fine arts, just like, what? Why did I do this? What was this for the world? Is, is, doesn't necessarily embrace people like us, right? But uh, a lot of those qualities, a lot of the ways that I look at an art piece, I look at the kind of work that I do today because I work in radio, I work in, in editing, and I still use a lot of those kind of visual cues and visual ticks for something that you would consider as unrelated. But uh, it's helped me out a lot. Yeah. I think it wasn't until I worked at that camp, that, that adoptee camp, that I was like, oh, this is kind of like my people, I guess, it is just being a Korean American adoptee. Right. If, if, if I could fall into any sort of category. Right. Um, because up until that point, yeah, I don't know. Like maybe I was Korean. Maybe I was Korean American. I'm not sure. Um, I didn't have anybody to tell me otherwise. Right. But I really think I came into my own, started, I hate to use the term because, uh, but it's a bit overused, but a, a bit of a late bloomer, it, it, like sort of in, in, in university. But it wasn't until I was out here because you've really got to figure out how to get out there, right? And I'm not saying you have to be an extrovert. I'm not saying you have to be a go-getter, but you're, you're gonna have to meet people. You're gonna have to talk to people, no matter how introverted you are. Really at points, believe in yourself, right? Because it, it can be very, tar very hard at times and you're gonna, you're gonna question a lot of things, uh, who you are, your identity, your purpose. You have the ability to, or, or, Hopefully you can find someone who, who can help you out uh, in that regard. But uh, you can. Mm. My name is Marcos Sinche, and this is my Korean American story. <laughs> <laughs>